name is Lauren, this is Matthew, Minna, Lindsay, and Nathan, and our presentation is called No Records Remain. Pocahontas, 17th century. I am the favorite daughter of Wahoo Seneca, the chief of the Powhatan, and this is my story. I was given the playful nickname of Pocahontas when I was young, but as I matured, I was called Matoka. Thomas, 17th century. My name is Thomas Rock. You know my parents. My father, John, introduced tobacco to Virginia. My mother went by many names. One was Matoka. Pocahontas, Matoka, Rebecca. Throughout my life, I saw a lot of change. The biggest change being when the white men came. I had never seen one until my uncle brought John Smith into our midst. We performed our ritual to initiate him as, as a chief in order to better relations between our peoples. According to Smith, though, it was an attempted slaughter, and I had saved him from it. White men know nothing of our rituals. Christian, 18th century. I've been told the Indians are plagued by drunkenness, robberies, and murders, that they are far from salvation. But as a missionary, I, Christian Rauch, will not be discouraged, for I am confident in my Lord. I believe that one does not have to be civilized in order to be Christianized. May God have mercy on the one who should believe otherwise, for conversion is possible for everyone. Possible? Jacob, 18th century. While conversion is possible for everyone, does it even matter? The Moravian mission came to my Delaware tribe in 1772, a few years before the Americans began their war, and established the mission town of Matthew. We became pacifists in the middle of America's revolution in the worst geographic location possible. Next to the American Fort Pitt, nobody believed in our neutrality. Governor Morris, 18th century. My job as governor is to make the unpopular decisions that I believe are right, are best for our people, my people. Even if that means the extermination of all the Indians, I don't care who or what they believe in. If I believe the Indians are harmful to our society, then it's my job to get rid of them. I'm the only one that knows that. At least, I'm the only one with the will to act on it. I need to bring peace to my people and theirs alike, even if that means giving up my personal needs and wants, giving up my sense of self. In April 1614, I married John Rolfe to create more peace. It worked, seeing as the new term, Peace of Pocahontas, was coined within the settlement. I also have come to bridge a peaceful gap. I arrived in New York in the summer of 1740 to share the treasure of the gospel with my fellow neighbors, the Indians. However, I was initially not met with acceptance. Heathens. Heathens? Heathens? They call my mother's people heathens. My father never would have married her if she hadn't converted. When I was born in 1650, I was symbolic of peace, something Virginia so desperately wanted. The Indians were just so strange. Heathens, running around and dancing everywhere. They were so different from us, they couldn't possibly have the same values as us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any conflict. A long trek. The British and Wyandots forced us from our home in Mad Union, fearing we were spying for the rebels. The road was terrible. We traveled for about a month in the cold, 125 miles from home. Into what? In Captive's Town, there are no beds or blankets, no game or provisions. We were surviving on just one pint of corn a day, and we knew we wouldn't last until spring. Starving, my family tried to return to Madden Putin, but we were taken prisoner and thankfully released. My group, followed by the most of my tribe, again made the journey back home. In 1610, there were whisperings among my people of the English planning a kidnapping. So my father sent me to live with my new husband, Kokwa, of the Patalonic tribe. He meant well, but ultimately put me into more harm's way. In 1613, I boarded a ship with the chief of the Patalonic, his wife, and a white man named Captain Samuels for a feast to show the peace between us. I did not know it was a trap until the chief and his wife were given gifts and left the ship without me. I had been kidnapped with the help of the very people my father expected to protect me. Indians threatened to hang me in the woods, and settlers intoxicated the Indians, hoping they would kill me in a drunken rage. One Indian even ra ran after me with a hatchet and chased me out of Shekomeko. But eventually, the Indians began to admire my perseverance. However, it did not happen overnight. It took many two-mile treks to and from Shekomeko, 
before they changed their minds about me. My family went to England when I was a young child. The voyage and the place wore on my mother and I both. We toured England for seven months, meeting important people and fundraising, the perfect example of what could be achieved in the new world. We both got sick just before we were due to go home. I lived and she didn't. She told my father, all must die. It's enough the child lives. My next long journey wasn't for another 20 years when I sailed home to my birthplace. I didn't let my land play with these savages. The only way to run them out was to encourage violence and hatred towards these people. They were disgusting, uncivilized. They lived in tents for crying out loud. If they were all right with living in tents, then why can't they just close down camp and keep moving west? I guess that's why I'm here. A new, a new approach. approach. The Indians began to think of me as different, different from the Dutch and English Christians that they had previously encountered. They started to invite me into their homes for shelter. They have allowed me to place my life into their hands. My father left me in England to recover. It was supposed to be temporary. He died five years later, and I never saw him again. I don't know why he left me behind. Maybe it's because he thought I looked like my mother. Sometimes, I wonder if he was afraid that I need to stay in England to stay like him, white for all intents and purposes, Christian. I was raised in England by my uncle. I was English. I might have stayed there forever, but for my inheritance. I, I inherited, inherited influence. influence. I inherited power. I inherited conflict. I inherited a legacy. I was brought to Jamestown and overseen by a man named Sir Thomas Gates for most of my time there. It was quite depressing, but I knew any retaliation would only worsen whatever ties remained between my people and theirs. I learned English, the ways of Christianity, and other traditions of English people. After a failed negotiation in which I was supposed to be returned to my father, I gave up hope and converted to Christianity to help my people and better the views of English people about our tribe. The English began calling me Rebecca after this conversion, as if I had any choice in the matter. Rebecca. There were so many Indians, it was becoming dangerous. Did you expect me to let them keep growing in numbers and wait for the day that they decided that they wanted to be in charge? It was clear, I had to find and kill. Forgive me, but you killed one of my friends, so now I have to kill all of you. How can I convince all the people that volunteer scouting parties were the right way to go? Four days before the attack, we and Dot and Shawnee Indians came in, warning us they had just killed a white woman and her child near the Ohio River. We feared the Americans would retaliate here. Later, I found out Commander James Marshall ordered an unsanctioned militia to investigate the Muskingum villages. He didn't consult our allies at Fort Pitt. Marshall just acted. 150 to 200 men went out with Colonel Williamson, his family's incredibilities to defend. I saw them shoot and scalp Shabash's son as they entered Naden Newton and hid in the bushes to avoid being scalped as well. Bounties. How else was I supposed to convince people to voluntarily kill as many Indians as they could? All I had to do was provide a little bit of money for a greater reward. Perhaps that's why love money is the root of all evil. I am not a bounty. Loss. The militia entered Naden Hooten and took my people prisoner without contest, blaming us for settler deaths and theft. They had first told us that we were going to be fine. We were going to Fort Pitt. They would return all of our belongings later. They then separated the men from the women and children and went to debate about what to do with my people. I hid with the women. I knew in past raids they spared the women and children. I assumed that was my best chance. They deliberated for three days, and in the end, only a tenth decided not to participate. Some offered to save just the children, but Williamson didn't think that was fair. Let it be known, most of them were not bloodthirsty, per se. I don't think they all wanted total annihilation, but they were silent, and that was enough. They told us to prepare to die. We sang and prayed until the end. A baptized Indian, Daniel, died in March of 1744. I held a conference with several Indian leaders to decide on the arrangements for his burial. The ground was covered with snow, so he held the funeral in the main worship hall. I delivered a corp sermon and then sang several hymns with the congregation. May he rest in peace. My husband moved us to England in 1616 to parade me around as his trophy, proof that the savages could be tamed. 
The victory was short-lived, though, because my son and I fell ill in 1617, right before we were supposed to travel back to America. In Gravesend, I found my eternal resting place. My father had left me his entire plantation, and my grandfather, Juan Hussein, had left me land, too. My uncle schemed to take some of it as payment for his guardianship, so I sailed to Virginia when I was 20 to reclaim the rest of my roots. I met and married a woman in Virginia named Jane Poitras. Her father was wealthy, and she helped establish my place in Virginia. I knew my father's people and my father's ways, but I didn't know who my mother had come from. I wanted to know. I wanted to see the other half of my heritage. I petitioned the governor to meet my uncle Open Shinnecock and my aunt Cleopatra. Of that meeting, no records remain. No records remain. No records remain. No records remain. In 1644, my uncle Opatinikov attacked the colony's edges. His forces killed more people this time than the last attack, but the colony had grown so large that it didn't really wipe us out this time. By 1646, I couldn't stay out of the English Indian conflict anymore. I became a lieutenant in the Virginian army, and they put me in charge of one of the forts constructed to defend against the natives. I had to fight my mother's own people, me and just a few men at my side. I had to shoot to kill. After murdering the non-Moravians, the white men took one man with a rope around his neck, stunned him with a cooper's hammer, and then scalped him alive like an animal. They did this with all the men, and then the women and children, scalping, of course, to avoid wasting ammunition. I hid in the cellar until nightfall and watched blood pour into it, and heard a woman begging for mercy, but that didn't stop their hand. The people from Salem, they had welcomed the white people in, were similarly killed, though our brethren from Schoen Room mercifully killed. I escaped at night through a window and met the only other survivor in the woods. We ran to Sandusky to tell Moravian Zeisberger what we saw. Thankfully, I left the building when I did, for as I ran away, the men burned the village to the ground. After the French and Indian War, I resigned as governor. I was tired of it anyways, tired of constantly arguing with that bald Yonkson, Ben Franklin, tired of convincing the assembly to fund our wars, Tired of playing the bad guy even though it was the only way to protect the ones I cared about. The truth is, I fear for what they're gonna say about me in the future. He was a madman, or he abused his power. Sorry for protecting you and your families, but I'm done making those tough decisions. Whomever takes my position can be the good guy if they want, but I won't be around to help when things get rough. So I left Pennsylvania. I decided to become the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. A new life, a new audience. This was the only way I could maintain my high status, but avoid the dirty work I've been accustomed to doing my whole life. Eventually, after living in Canada, I went back to Ohio in the late 1790s. When the land was depleted and parceled out to settlers, and I had to leave home once again. The bodies of my tribe were left to rot for over a decade before they were buried in mass graves. I saw the torture and burning of another white man in retaliation for our genocide. But the men who committed this massacre were never convicted of anything. The two white men in charge of our investigation suppressed the truth to keep their positions in power instead of struggling for justice. They tried to erase our history. The Moravian mission in Chagomeco was ultimately terminated in April of 1746. Afterwards, I traveled to Jamaica and spent my last years in the mission ministering to the inhabitants of the island. I continued to do what I loved spreading the good news of the gospel by the grace of my savior. It gave me more land for my service. I accumulated more wealth and influence. I became another instrument to repress my mother's people. They captured Open Chen Pao and killed him, and the war ended. The treaty pushed the Palatine to the north side of the York River, even farther away from me, even less chance to reconcile. Sometimes I think about my service. I made my choices, and I made my descendants' choices too. I made us Anglo-Virginian. I married a white woman, and our daughter married into a white family. Slowly, my mother's blood diffused and weakened. White, white. Christian, Christian, and English. Those were the labels I couldn't embrace. Those were the only way to be accepted. The, the ends justify, justify the means. means.